The EU Exit Working Group, uh, and today we're talking to the Mayor about his discussions with central government and their negotiations of uh, implementing the referendum of leaving the EU. We've got some formal business, Mr Mayor, if we can, if we can just do through this. So I don't think we have, but let's go through it. Apologies for absence. Yeah. Okay, there are none. Moving on, declarations of interest. Uh, the officer's advice is before you. Are there any declarations that people wish to make? No. Okay, uh, we're now on the main item of the briefing um, for today, which is with the Mayor. So thank you, uh, Mayor, <coughs> for that giving some time to us today. For members of the public following on the webcast or on YouTube, you can also follow us on Twitter at the London Assembly and take part in the meeting discussion following uh, hashtag Brexit. Uh, since the agendas were published, we've received a letter from the Mayor in response to the working group letters. Uh, the letter on, I think, the open mic issue. And I've also had a further correspondence with the Mayor about security, which is going to uh, security post EU exit, uh, which we will talk further with the Mayor. Um, can I ask the working group to note the letter that, that was being shared with us? Great. And so we can append it to future minutes. Thank you very much. Mr Mayor, we're going to ask you a number of questions. Clearly there may be other issues that you wish to raise with us. Please feel free to do so if we can. If I can begin with the first set, set of questions, which is really about the discussions uh, with, I think, with David Davis, the Secretary of State. Is he a Secretary of State? I yes, think he is. He is. Um, so just to set out what you, you know, your strategy in those discussions. So can I say, I've been impressed with the engagement from David Davis with me. If I just explain, before Theresa May became Prime Minister and David Cameron was still Prime Minister after referendum, up until his resignation, I had one meeting with Oliver Letwin, who was the person charged by David Cameron to be in charge of Brexit negotiations, and obviously it was early stages. I asked David Davis firstly to be a member of the Joint Ministerial uh, Committee uh, for very good reasons, constitutional reasons. That's the devolved administration of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales, and not unreasonably he said no. I did try, uh, very hard. He made an offer, which I accepted, which was to meet me regularly bilaterally, to discuss with him my concerns uh, about uh, uh, what Brexit could mean for London, but also so I could raise with him issues that I wanted to raise as the Mayor of London. I think I've met him six or seven times. Uh, the last two or three occasions I've taken experts with me, different sectors, so the initial discussions were around what we need to get out of a, a deal with the EU, uh, my emphasis was in relation to a transitional deal, phase implementation, interim deal, cast iron guarantee for EU citizens. It soon became clear that phase one is inverted commas divorce, phase two is then trade. So I've then moved on to taking with me uh, experts. I have a Brexit advisory panel. So I've taken with me on one occasion uh, Sir John Sorrell, an expert in the creative industries. The last meeting I took along Professor Alice Guest, uh, higher education. I was due to meet David Davis yesterday, taking along an expert uh, in relation to digital, but for understandable reasons he's engaged with the European Council. Uh, and uh, I've been impressed with his willingness to listen and engage, uh, challenge me as I challenge him. When I meet people around uh, the city, the good news is it appears that they have heard from or are about to hear from David Davis, good sign, because what you wouldn't want is a situation where they've not heard from the Secretary of State or vice versa. Uh, and so, look, the, the, devil's gonna, the proof's going to be in, in, in the eating and stuff, but I, I've been impressed with my engagement. I can raise points with him. Uh, some of the things he can't answer yet, for obvious reasons. A number of the things we discuss are private, for reasons you appreciate, I can't discuss. And that's part of the confidence building measures, he and I and I and him, uh, which is why things don't leak. And that's really important. Okay, and we, um, we do understand the issue of the private nature of part of that conversation and the bits that you can, but can you give us a flavour of some of the topics that you think you'll be planning to raise in the coming months? We ask that because that might help us in terms of uh, supporting you of some of the issues and doing some uh, preliminary work with some of our expert witnesses. Chair, why don't I share with you offline the various sectors I intend to raise with David Davis over the next, say, three, four months. Mm you can feed into those discussions. We decided what would be helpful for his civil servants is to take sector experts with me, not just me batting for London, but people who are experts. Uh, and we'll send you the, 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 the next two or three sectors we've got worked out. Just to show things have moved on, and this is progress, I think. I'm not claiming sole credit. Um, before the general election, we talked about 
you can call it transitional arrangements, interim deal, phased implementation. And the response was, not really, we think we can do a done deal by March 2019. For a variety of reasons, we've now reached a position where, if you read the Prime Minister's speech in Florence, she accepts transitional period, question two, three, four years. That's good. There's an issue about, we need certainty, and I'll come on to later on maybe when by. Another issue, and you've, you've seen overnight the Prime Minister's Facebook post to uh, Londoners who are EU citizens, but also around the country, that's progress, if you remember, and I, and, I, and I read, and I was speaking to you before we started the meeting, how emotional just the transcript was reading the open mic session and some of the Londoners who gave evidence to uh, you, you know the anxieties. And that's progress made uh, uh, as well. Um, clearly for me, one of the big issues is, um, uh, is, the, is, is London as a movement. Uh, and so we're going to carry on making progress. I think, I think as we go onwards, it'll be sector by sector. Um, the key thing now, I suspect the next time meeting with David Davis is by when we need details of the transitional deal. You speak to the Deputy Governor of Bank of England, he says Christmas. You speak to City UK, they say first quarter, CBI says first quarter. Why do they say that? Because they've got a plan for what happens March 2019. You speak to aviation sector, by the way, because WTO doesn't apply to aviation, they say one year in advance of March 2019. So I suspect uh, that'll be the key focus of our next uh, discussion. Um, but again, for reasons that you'll appreciate, you know, David Davis has got to be very careful in relation to what he says to me that's private because this can affect things like, and I'm not over, <coughs> overemphasizing the role David Davis has, but you know, the pound, share prices, all the rest of it and stuff. And so we've got to be a bit sensitive about that information. But those sorts of things I'm raising with him. But of course, I'm very happy for you to make representations to me and suggestions which I will raise with him. <coughs> Thank you for that. <coughs> you mentioned about the role of your. Uh, the advisory group yeah. that you've established. In, in a sense, you've probably got two advisory groups in terms <coughs> of you've got the Brexit expert advisory group and you've got your mayor's business advisory group. Um, just uh, d uh, just g give us a, a paint us a picture in terms of how you found that beneficial to have in those discussions. Do, do you know, in <coughs> and have so, you set up any other expert panels? Sure. So, uh, so the, the Brexit advisory panel. Uh, uh, we didn't ask them how they voted, by the way, uh, in relation to, but, you know, the, the, the issue was the expertise, financial, higher education, culture, uh, science, life sciences. And the relationship there actually although it is more bilateral. So my team will ring up an expert and say, listen, what's your view on blah? So for example, last week or the week before I published an immigration paper, uh, uh, just in time we're right in relation to, oh, you'll be aware they look at the Migration Advisory Committee is looking at immigration doesn't report to next year, which causes us some concern. So I gave some, so I gave submission to uh, them last week. Particular issues of expertise they've got, we well, haven't got in relation to a whole host of issues from construction to life sciences to higher education. So conversation will be had bilaterally rather than us meeting as a group. The mm -hmm. diaries are very, very busy. I mean, these are you know people who, you know, to get a date in the diary three months time is very difficult. And so it's bilateral conversations, mainly virtually emails, um, phone calls as well. Uh, very little face-to-face -face contact uh, because of diary pressures. Separately, there's, there's a business advisory board which advises on a whole host of issues uh, uh, to do with um, you know, London's place as a previous place of uh, business. Obviously, there's an overlap, but the Brexit advisory panel understand their specialism, as far as I'm concerned, to me and the expertise I want is on, on, on Brexit, on uh, you know, flexible workforces, on the movement of capital, goods, labour, and people, and those sorts of issues, but also for example, they will have private chats with me about, listen, we're now making plan B. We can't go public on this. We're letting you know, not to just, just so you know what we're doing. Or, for example, some of the um, pipeline stuff in relation to announcements we're now making now, but just so you know, the pipeline's not as heavy as it was a year ago, a year and a half ago. And so don't be surprised if in 12 months' time, things aren't great for my company. Those sorts of confidential conversations. Okay. <coughs> um, <coughs> now, the previous mayor had Ger Gerald Lyons uh, advise him as his chief. Have you got, who's, is there a number of people advising on specific economic uh, challenges for London? Is it a number of people that you're taking advice on, or have you, have you owned in on one particular so the, the deputy mayor for The deputy mayor for business is yeah. Rajesh Agrawal. Yeah. Uh, the business advisory board have a huge role, all of them collectively. We yeah. meet regularly, I think the next meeting is next week. In relation to advice they give me, then there's advice offline. There's no one guru I've got that I go to who is the sort of oracle. A whole host of people advise me on a whole host of issues. 
Okay, <coughs> um, I just want to turn now, and you mentioned earlier about the devolved uh, nations in that sense, and of course we're not um, Scotland, we're not Wales, and we're not Northern Ireland, but we do have uh, characteristics that are similar in terms of interest and where, where, where we work. In some of the letters that I've had back from you, it talks about that we're, we're working with the Metro mayors, we're talking of that. Do you, has, that, has that initial conversation with David Davis sort of pushed you away from cooperation with the devolved bodies? Or do you think um, it's just it's, it's not there? Because I, I think I'd like to make a, a counter push on that in the sense that no, we're not Catalonia, and no, we don't go it alone, and we're not making a bid for that, and we're not saying we're of the same status. I don't, and I agree with you. We don't necessarily need to sit round the table. And I think you've 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 explained, I thought rather well this morning, that actually the conversation with David Davis, we're achieving probably, I think, a probably greater outcome than maybe some of those formal discussions that we're having around the committee table in some some senses about a London perspective. But what, what, what would be the common areas, in your view, that we could work with them on? Um, because we're doing some work with the scrutiny bodies, but we're uh, 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 just not, sure, sure. you know, have I, have I got it wrong? Because I've just responded to your letters or... <coughs> Can I say, first, first of all, representations have been made to me to international declare independence. I've, I've declined <laughs> this representation. Please don't. Uh, but can I say, we, so, so uh, actually, if you like, I'm riding a number of horses. Yep. So there's a bilateral meetings with David Davis. Uh, I've, I've met and spoken to Nicholas Sturge and Carwin Jones. Uh, I was with Andy Street, uh, Andy Burnham, um, the mayors for Cambridge and Peterborough, um, the mayor for West of England um, last week uh, in relation to infrastructure, and they're coming to City Hall shortly, all seven. Um, this, one of the issues we'll discuss is uh, this. My officials speak regularly to Wales and Scotland. Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland's a bit different, we do speak to them. Uh, we talk to Gibraltar as well. Um, there's lots of commonality actually. Uh, I think you're right to, to uh, your, your analysis is correct. I'll give you an example. So in Scotland there is a, uh, I'll speak a shorthand, there is a need for uh, talent. There's a, there's, a, there, there's a skill shortage. They have actually a, a shortage occupation list. Um, very few occupations on there, but they do have one. And they've been devolved that power to uh, do so. They've got actually I use the phrase veto powers we haven't got in relation to the final agreement and uh, stuff. Concerns they've got similar to us in relation to monies they currently receive directly from Brussels. Their concern is if it goes to Westminster, will they be able to, the UK shared uh, prosperity fund. We've got similar concerns, the difference is we've not got the veto. Um, so there are lots of commonalities and we speak regularly uh, to them. I'll give you another example. At one of the evidence sessions you had, and I read the trial with interest, around uh, regional visas. It's obviously an issue that all of us are thinking about, but actually we all recognise the nation state means one immigration policy. It's U UK BA, not Scotland BA, or Wales BA, or London uh, BA. And so we, we have regular conversations. Some of it is official to official, some of it is me with the relevant first uh, ministers. But I want you to think all our regs in the, are in the bilateral baskets. Um, the metro mayors, the northern metro mayors, have publicly complained, for example. They've only met David Davis once very, very recently. Um, I know, for example, when I compare and contrast the meetings I've had with David Davis, they are more than the meetings Nicholas Sturgeon and uh, Carvin Jones have uh, had. They've actually only been two meetings they've had with the JMC where the Prime Minister's chaired. So, in my opinion, humble opinion, I think we are nudge, 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 achieving more. But actually, to be fair, we won't see the benefits of these discussions until phase two, the trade part of it. The, the divorce part is important because of the three <coughs> things that, that the EU and the UK have got to resolve. Um, Northern Ireland doesn't really involve us, involve us directly. Yeah. The financial settlement does affect us because of things like Horizon 2020 uh, and all the rest of which we can, we, we can uh, uh, come into. EU citizens affects us a lot. Uh, and so we're involved in that and I think we've got some progress there. Again, not claiming all the credit. In the trade part, really important. We've got a massive, massive uh, role. And I think to be fair, the country needs us to do one well of those discussions around trade uh, because you know we're so important to our country's economy. And I suppose the third part, which will come later, is about lobbying uh, Parliament about some of the regulatory issues that we may lose or adopt, depending on those trade parts around environmental regulations, other issues that consumer issues that are equally important. They're connected to trade, but 
obviously some of them will be parliamentary acts. So the, 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 the UK withdrawal bill, we, we, we're working, yeah. we've suddenly got a parliamentary lobbying yeah. operation taking place, cross-party by the way, it's, yeah. it's got to be cross-party. Yeah. Um, really, really uh, important. I'll give you an example. Um, Anne Bude Ledson, when she was the Secretary of State for DEFRA, said, and I'm paraphrasing, two th when she gave evidence to a committee, two-thirds of environmental laws will be in domestic legislation, two-thirds. Mm -hmm. Well, that begs the question, what's the third missing? Uh, could you get the progress made around waste, around recycling, around air quality, a number of other issues. The issue is regulation, monitoring and enforcement. So if we're missing a third of the legislation, domestic legislation, let's assume we had 100% still legislation, still begs the question, monitoring and regulation. So we've got to be very, very careful. Environment's probably the best example for us as London in relation to what we don't want is a, a levelling down to worse than the EU. My view is we can have EU plus if we work cleverly with the government, uh, but also with Parliament. It's got to be the executive and the legislature, which means cross-party, but also discussions with the SOS, the Secretaries of State, whether it's uh, Home Secretary. One of my big concerns is in relation to security. So I'm saying to the Home Secretary, uh, look, it's really important we have some red lines in relation to security, whether it's um, the Prume Agreement, whether it's um, a European arrest warrant, uh, whether it's uh, Europol, uh, whether it's the Schengen Information System, whether it's the passenger information records, irrespective of the deal that's made, we've got to have as, at least as good as what we've got now in relation to uh, Michael Gove, the new DEFRA Secretary of State, in relation to environment. And it's a different Secretary of State yeah. who have different conversations about what we want from domestic legislation. Okay, good. And we might want to consider that regulatory stroke monitoring bit at the future and try and get ahead of the game before we get into that actual activity. Okay, and and I just this is what might sound a bit of an odd question, but it's worth asking. I think uh, thinking aloud. So, powers and responsibilities currently exercised at European level. Should we be trying to repatriate that in the devolvement debate back to London? Is there anything you've come across yet that you think that I, I think I'm conscious that there may be the elements of that. Um, yesterday we were having a discussion around uh, European funding issues and about how that would work or not work and all the rest of it was one in my mind that was possible. It only came up to me yesterday. So what is there anything you feel you've come across that says, actually, you know, that should be part of a development debate in, here in the UK post-Brexit? Uh, I think there are a number of different issues. What is what powers in the small P we've got now? I think I accept, and we should all accept, with humility, we haven't got a Scotland Act or a Wales Act. We've, so we've not got the, I use the phrase veto powers, but you get the point, yeah. um, in relation to things they will take back from Brussels to uh, Edinburgh or to uh, Cardiff or to Belfast. We've not got the same levers they've got. But in relation to a future devolution deal, yeah, I think, I think there's a really serious discussion to have with the uh, government. For example, if just some of the LFC recommendations from Boris Johnson's London Finance Commission or my second version were implemented, I think that would, that would alleviate some of the concerns we've got as Londoners about some of the resources and powers going from Brussels to Westminster rather than Brussels to London, Cardiff, Belfast and Edinburgh. I'll give you one example which you raised yesterday. I read the, I read the summary um, in relation to yesterday, a readout in relation to issues around uh, the European Structural Investment Fund. Uh, actually, if we aren't cute, some of the monies we can bid for from Brussels, which is much funded by government departments and, and others, uh, including us, may go to Westminster and be lost from London. Uh, and so the irony is we could have less control over our destiny afterwards than before. I'm not saying that will happen, but that's what we've got to avoid and stuff. So there's two ways we've got to answer. That's why I think the GLA has got a, somebody's got a big role to play in relation to those discussions. Because if you are a Londoner, who voted to leave the European Union, I suspect you didn't vote to have less control in the future after we've left the EU than you have uh, now. That's why I think the government's got to recognise in relation to powers and resources down to the, the people nearest the cold face. And so that, that, that's, and if you're a Brexiteer in government or even in parliament, you need to recognise you want it to be a success. And so those, and that's why it's really important to have engagement. I'm criticised by some people for having Good frank, candid chats with members of the government. I don't apologise for that. You know, you know, London works will work closely with the government, whatever whatever hue or colour the government is. True. Um, and I just, I suppose, and part of yesterday was 
was really about sort of if you, you know, we've all got different views about uh, Leave and Remain and, you know, uh, around on the decision that's been taken uh, post, you know, following the referendums. But is it your view? So the contention made by Lord Esseltai yesterday was almost, I think, and I'm paraphrasing, that we put, you know, you need, regardless of Brexit, we need a new settlement here. But in terms of uh, Brexit, actually, it's more important to talk about a new settlement and some of those issues if we're going to face the challenges of the future. Is that where your contention is about some of these, this, this work? I, I think we are leaving the European Union. Um, I think that accelerates the need for there to be great devolution yeah. on a whole host of issues. Um, and, and I think the government's got to recognise that it's in nobody's interest for London to do less well afterwards than before. Mm. And that must mean more devolution. That's actually, you mentioned uh, early on, you know, what working relationship we have with other metro mayors. That's one of the things we all agree on, by the way, whether you're in the west of England, Cambridgeshire or Peterborough, Greater Manchester, uh, Liverpool, West Midlands, Tees Valleys. We all agree there needs to be greater devolution. By the way, Scotland and Wales uh, as well. And that'll make us more efficient in a whole host of issues and stuff. And I'm, I'm hoping that uh, Brexit provides an opportunity to kickstart the devolution discussion that we had. I don't think we need a constitutional convention uh, in relation to some of these stuff. It can, we, can have, we can do it now. There are longer term discussions about, look, there are people who live in London who feel disconnected with City Hall, with the local council. Forget Parliament and Brussels. There's a separate discussion we had there about how we connect them better to people like us. You know, it's in nobody's interest for them to think politics doesn't work, we're all out of touch. And so that's, I think, a more medium-term, long-term conversation. In the short term, I think, uh, is right, Lord, Helsine, Lord Helsine is right that Brexit uh, should accelerate the need for a, a new settlement in relation to how we do things in the country and the city. OK. And, and, of course, you know, everyone is working in a very pragmatic way following the referendum. If we just turn to your personal views now about the situation, because I, um, I think I saw somewhere today about some red lines on particular issues that you thought were important, that you've got to get right, but also in terms that you've commented about a second referendum on the deal, I think, uh, around that and that endorsement. So let's, let's just turn to that about um, uh, those issues and yeah, just give us your views. Let's, let's, first, <coughs> with, let's first start with red lines. Um, <coughs> the DG of MI5 this week has said uh, that we face the most severe terror threat we've ever faced. Separately, we've heard the head of counter terror saying the increase in terror attacks and attempts for this year, 740, is not a spike but a shift. Uh, also we know that the, the cross-border criminality from guns, uh, from uh, kidnapping, from modern slavery and a whole host of uh, issues. We currently have very good bilateral links. Uh, uh, if, you, if you listen to the head of MI5, he was talking about joint operations, intelligence sharing. So those bilateral links exist anyway. We have, we have met police teams in various big cities around Europe and around the world. In addition, we've got excellent links with the, uh, these countries in the EU because of a number of things. European arrest warrant, uh, the Prum agreement. So the European arrest warrant means we can bring bad people back swifter and vice versa. Prum agreement. Uh, means that we can we can share a whole host of things from DNA, fingerprints, vehicle uh, details. We can check the names of passengers on watch lists because of the European uh, Union. Europol means we can we can you know, we can see who's wanted, uh, but also who are who are potentially um, criminals or in other countries. And there are other examples: the Schengen Information List uh, as well. I think, irrespective of the negotiations and how they pan out, these are things that we need to have even after we've left the European Union. And my point in relation to us is, irrespective of the deal we do with the EU, this makes us safe and secure. And my point to friends in, the, in, in Europe would be, irrespective of what happens with the deal, this makes you guys safer as well. So uh, there's no downside to us agreeing on these six, uh, uh, what I call red lines areas, and let's get it over and done with as soon as possible. And by the way, that creates <coughs> good will on both sides in relation to all the other stuff that may be more contentious. Second issue you asked about <coughs> second referendum. Look, I accept the verdict of the British public. I may not like it, um, but we are we are. And so my job as the mayor is to make it work. My job is to make sure that the deal we do with the European Union is good for uh, London. Now, I say this, I don't think it'll be as good as the deal we had before, but that's life. We, we, you know, the British public voted on the referendum and voted to leave the European Union. By the way, London voted to remain by a decisive margin, which, which has similarities with Scotland. 
Scotland and London uh, and Northern Ireland voted to stay, but accept, I, I think, uh, the verdict of the, uh, the British uh, uh, public. I was asked a question, are there hypothetical scenarios where you could have a second referendum? Well, I gave those hypothetical uh, scenarios, but in my negotiations and discussions and meetings with ministers, with foreign dignitaries, with business leaders, I always say, listen, uh, we've got to accept the verdict of the British public and work to make uh, a success of the, uh, of the, um, the referendum. Uh, I still think, by the way, London can and will be the greatest city in the world after we've left the EU. Uh, you know, privately, I might, think it's, I might think it's despite leaving the EU. That's not the point. The point is the underlying strengths of our city will remain uh, our talent, uh, the get up in our attitude, uh, our universities, uh, the legal system, uh, the ecosystem. It's not just financial London, it's financial, culture, tech, R&D, science. Uh, and so those underlying strengths aren't going to go away. One of the reasons, Len, I'm going to India and Pakistan is to bat for London. You know, I never go anywhere <coughs> and don't, don't speak volumes about our city, but I do it with evidence. I never also blindly am jingoistic about London. My, my jingoism is based on the evidence. We're a great city. Those underlying strengths are here. They'll still be here, even though we left the European Union. Thank you. And I suppose, um, just to sum up in terms of that, I, I get the feeling, even from... Uh, those who wanted to stay in the EU, but particularly from a, you know people that were wanting to leave the EU, that they're coming to a view that no deal is not good enough, right for them in terms of that, and that the consequences of that. Is that what you're picking up in terms of talking when you talk to people that say, look, I voted to get out, but I'm really concerned about this issue and this issue and all the rest of it. We've done some survey, not we as Assembly, but I'm aware of some survey work, which is done both for leavers and remainers. We're saying, actually, uh, we're worried about a no deal. Look, there's this, the best way to chance that is you talked about voters. There's, there's the government and there's voters. So yeah. the conversation I've had with parliamentarians and the government, they've moved. So when I gave evidence to the select committee that Henry Bench is, uh, the point I made there was no deal means WTO terms. No, no deal doesn't mean status quo. Yeah. And there's a misconception, even amongst politicians uh, and the government, what no deal means. So in goods, tariffs, by the way, 44% of our exports are to the EU. 44%. Imagine tariffs on those goods and then non-goods tariffs in relation to other issues that are all being services. 60% of our exports, 60% are to countries that have a deal with the EU. 88% with, with countries and the EU where a deal is about to be done. So no deal means WTO, which is bad. By the way, for aviation, there are other WTO terms. On aviation, there is no WTO deals, which is why Philip Hammond said last week, and he wasn't scaring people, he was saying, we've got to understand, if there's no aviation deal with the European Union, then what, what does it mean for our planes going to the USA, going to uh, India, going to other parts of the world? Because WTO doesn't apply. So, and I think the government's waking up to this now. Uh, and the language, so you, you saw Amber Rudd saying it would be inconceivable there being no deal. She understands in relation to security, her particular area and stuff. Separate issue about voters. I think, I think, look, people voted to leave for a variety of reasons. It's really complicated. Some of it's emotional, some of it's the pace of immigration, some of it's the impact of local services, some of it's because they've seen a race at the bottom. Could be a variety of reasons why people voted to leave the European uh, Union. I think it's patronising when politicians say people didn't understand what they, what they were voting for. I think, it's, it, I think I feel uncomfortable saying that, and I don't say that. Some of it is in relation to promises made to them by people they respect, which we now realise, because they've, the people who made the promises have said that was just not true, that they, they, they believe the promises. So it's a bit different. I think what, we have, we, what we've got to do is to make sure we persuade those who are making the decisions why no deal is bad. Now, sure, I accept as a former lawyer who's to negotiate I can conceive of a situation where a deal is so bad, it's worse than no deal. I can conceive that, hypothetically speaking. But that deal would have to be worse than WTO terms to be worse than no deal. So there has to be a deal worse than WTO that's better than no deal. So I accept, hypothetically speaking, there's a scenario where you know, no deal is better than uh, a, a, a bad deal. But the reality is we've got to do a deal with the European Union. By the way, the good news, the EU understand that. A bad, a no deal is bad for the EU too. Because these businesses, and I say this with respect to my friends in Europe, and I've got mayors who I meet regularly, I'm going to meet the mayor next week of Paris, and other mayors. These companies, they leave London, 
with the greatest respect, probably are going to go to Paris, Frankfurt, Amsterdam, Berlin. Some will there'll be some fragmentation. They're going to go New York, Hong Kong, Singapore. Mm -hmm. So hard Brexit or no deal is not good for either of us, you European Union or us London. And I'm hoping, and I've, and I've seen movement, by the way, from our side, from uh, our side as a government, by the way. Her Majesty's government is our side. We've got to recognise that. We're on the same <coughs> side here. I see movement from our side in relation to, uh, you know, um, uh, no deal better than no deal being, uh, uh, you know, better than a bad deal. But we've got to carry on making progress. Thank you for that. Now, any questions on this section before we move on to the next section? <coughs> oh, well. yeah, I just wanted to pick up um, the conversation about devolution and um, looking at what you're going to develop as the <coughs> arse for London. Because one of the bits of evidence yesterday from the civil servant when he very cautious as all civil servants are but he did make it very clear that everyone talks about devolution but he's never seen that it's never presented in a very clear Chris this is practically at every level how it would work to put the case to then be persuasive and I was wondering what work you're putting into that area. So well, actually it's quite relevant so I've written to the borough leaders around uh, London about a joint submission we should do to the government on this very issue uh, which I'm happy to share with you once we've once they've signed it off it's actually with them now and so there are a number of different things we can do in relation to pots of money uh, that currently exist that we can get devolution uh, for. There's the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, which the government's talking about. No real details what that means. <coughs> is it, uh, is it ring fenced? Yeah. What does it mean? Uh, so this is an unknown in relation to what it means for London, but we're working with the councils because what I don't want to do is give an impression we're trying to suck power into City Hall. It's got to be London government. And so I'm happy to share that with you in relation to what devolution package would look like. Well, I think we shouldn't be afraid, though, actually, some things are best done at City Hall strategic Oh, and councils accept yeah. that in relation to a whole host of things, like the European Structure Infrastructure yeah. Fund. We can administer that far better. And you heard evidence yesterday in relation to low skills, enterprise, employment. Uh, we can do a lot, a lot. We could do a lot. And by the way, some of that is match funded by DWP and others who recognise we're far better at doing that than the government departments are. Yeah, yeah. great. No, I would like to see that, and I think we'd be interested in that. Uh, Jeanette Arnold and Gareth. <coughs> yes, Mayor, you just spoke about um, you, you meet up with mayors and uh, we know you're, you've said you're going to be meeting up with um, mayors around, I think, at the C next C4 meeting. But I was just wondering about your relationship with the rest of the mayors, I mean, there's a good few of them, across the EU and in places um, that, uh, you know, these mayors will be voting or determining the future and I'm just wondering um, whether you would agree with me that there is room for them to hear from you um, articulating that very point that you've just made that no deal is bad for all European cities. I don't think um, that I've heard much about that. There's, um, we, we've been talking about your relationship with Metro mayors and relationship uh, possibly with London boroughs, but, um, there's uh, that powerful alliance of European mayors who, like yourself, um, need to understand that no deal or a bad deal absolutely diminishes all European cities, and I don't know what work you're doing to actually reach out to them. I don't think it would, if you like, um, have a conflict with this no. uh, ongoing relationship that you have with the Secretary of State. It's part of your job to meet and do everything that you can. And um, I'm, I'm just aware that I'm not sure that you have actually reached out to a meeting of all European mayors and given them your view. No, I have. I, well, I'm so, so, well, I went to Brussels and, and did it. So I went to Brussels and the, center, the centerpiece of my speech in Brussels was hard Brexit is bad for you as it is for us. Uh, and I'm happy to say that I'm happy to circulate that speech I did in Brussels. I also got all the ambassadors in, all 27 into City Hall, uh, and explained to them. Uh, in, in a, you've got to do it with humility, not in an arrogant sort of jingoistic way. But listen, this hard Brexit is, is bad for us, but it's bad for you as well. And we had a, it's a very frank conversation with the EU citizens. I meet the mayor of Sofia, to, Sofia today. Uh, I meet regularly uh, mayors from other cities around uh, Europe and, and ministers as well. Uh, I met uh, Guy Furstad two weeks ago, who was uh, in London, and. You've got to do it in a respectful way, of course, in sort of an arrogant way. Uh, and I've said the same thing to the Mayor of Paris. And we've had visitors here to uh, London. Uh, we've had visitors to London, by the way, courting our businesses, um, which they're entitled to do. 
uh, you know, and so th th those messages I've said openly and frankly to not just mayors of us of other cities across Europe, their ambassadors um, and ministers from those countries as well, but also the, the centerpiece of my speech in Brussels when I went on my trip uh, earlier this year to Brussels was just that, um, you know, I don't think we should pretend that any city in Europe, any one city, can take what London offers. Sure, some may fragment, but actually the real losers are all of us, and the winners are the Hong Kongs, the Singapores, the New York, because they're global cities who could take some of this stuff. But I'll carry on doing that, because it's very important people hear this. Not in this again, you can't sort of say it in an arrogant way, talking down to, especially just so we're clear. By the way, that's not just what I say, that's what the banks I speak to say. You know, when you speak to these banks and these multinationals, that's what they say, because whichever city in Europe, and I, and I love Paris, I love Barcelona, I love Berlin, I love these other cities around Europe. Which other city in Europe is a global city with all the things that London has to offer? Uh, there are cities around the world that do. And so you'll explain this to them. And by the way, I've seen no evidence of European cities, European politicians that I've met wanting to punish us, say, you know what, because you vote to leave, we're going to do a bad deal with you, and you know, a hard Brexit will serve you, right? They're actually, they want to do a deal that works for them. They make the point, though, that you can't expect to be better off or as well off outside the club as you are inside the club. And that's not a reasonable point. <coughs> I, I, just to say, I totally agree with you. It's just that uh, recently I was, uh, as you know, I'm a U member of the UK delegation to the Committee of the Regions, and the president there uh, was speaking about the value of cities and, of course, of London. And um, I'm sure that if you uh, were to get an opportunity and an inv invitation, that the mayors there from Germany, from Austria, and from across Europe would welcome hearing from you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, um, there's been a lot of, I, I think, encouraging common ground, actually, in your remarks today and what we heard yesterday, um, <coughs> but particularly on a range of subjects, but particularly devolution. Uh, I agree with Caroline's statement just a moment ago that actually there are some things that are best placed at City Hall. Leaving aside any party political argument, uh, I do think there are some uh, strategic powers that could do with coming here. I'm not going to put up any straw men to be knocked down now, but um, the paper that you're writing and sending off to the government, you, you touched on pots of funding and things like that. Are you looking at powers in there as well? So there's, there's, there's the sort of piece of work we've done in relation to LFC2. The separate MOUs we're having with certain government departments, most recently this week I met with Justine Green in, in relation to progress on adult education. And so these are, these are department to department. What I've not done so far is an all-encompassing new sort mm. of LFC3 or a new devolution package, but I'm open to ideas from the working group. If that's the, but but that's, we've not, we've not, we're not suggesting that, because at the moment, if you remember the progress we made last year with the government around the MOUs and a whole host of issues from mm. finance to um, land value capture to a whole host of issues, we, we're, in the, we're on the process of almost finalising other health MIU. So the separate devolution package is taking place with government departments, obviously which number 10 coordinates, but yeah. there's not an overall new package post us leaving the European Union. Because leaving the EU, things, we won't get to Brexit day plus one and things will stay as they are for generations thereafter. Of course, things will change as, as time goes on. So it doesn't all have to be done in the space of 18 months. But I think there is an opening um, with Brexit to push for devolution. And, and it's not just on the financial side. So LFC 1 and 2 were primarily focused yeah. on financial powers and, um, and fundraising particularly and, and how we do land value capture and that sort of thing. Um, I'm thinking more about what the mayoralty would look like and what local government in London would look like. We're often compared with New York, but the systems are completely different. Um, and the New York mayor has um, powers and responsibilities that we don't have here in London. And the argument could be made, should we start looking at that? Should we start thinking about how we really upskill uh, the political institutions that we have? Um, and that, I think, is something that should be looked at. Um, I genuinely think that um, at all levels, we need to be starting to think about what the ask is going forward. And is that something that I appreciate you've got an urgent thing right now, but is that something that your office is going to consider going off into the future? I'm happy to work with the Assembly and others to look into that. Okay, that's good. Because I think we'd be very happy to work with you on that as well. Yeah, I think, I think you're right, that's got to be cross-party, it can't be, it can't be no. I think you're right. And, and the other thing that I would plead with on that is that we need to leave aside, in doing that work, it, it 
can't be about what is past political advantage. Really I mean, at, for my party at the moment in London, um, <coughs> taking power away from you would be a really good thing. But we need to drop that because actually there are some institutional arrangements which I think could be very beneficial regardless of who happens yeah. to be the mayor. Can I kind of say the good news on that is uh, I'm very impressed by the Metro Mayors. And, and by the way, the majority aren't Labour. Um, but I think that's an opportunity for us to recalibrate the relationship yeah. between cities and regions and Whitehall. Mm. Well, Michael Hesseltine made the um, case, I thought, quite effectively yesterday when he talked about devolution and where things should be done. Uh, and he's made that case for most of his career. Um, and he said it's got nothing to do with Brexit, we should be doing this anyway. Um, and I think that that was right. And I think there was, um, if those of us who were there, I think nobody dissented from that you know, for a single second. And I think that, that is the kind of tone that we need to take going forward. Yeah. Peter Whittle. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor, um, Len was asking you about your personal uh, position. Uh, I'm very encouraged to hear you say that we shouldn't patronise people, and that they basically voted for a number of different reasons. And, and I, I would know, I've never actually heard you say anything to that effect. Uh, I'm also quite pleased to hear you say that uh, hypothetically you could see a position where uh, no deal is best than a bad deal. Um, my question really is that. Are you of the opinion that you, one does here mention that the contents of a deal should therefore be subject to a second referendum? There was a step before that, which is the vote in Parliament. It depends what Parliament decides. Yeah, yeah. So if, for example, because the Parliament, yeah. because m many people who were advocating leaving the EU were advocating the British Parliament being sovereign. Mm. You can't have it both ways. If the British Parliament is sovereign, Surely they must have a vote on the deal our government does with Brussels, the executive. So the executive goes and does a deal with Brussels. It must be right if our parliament is sovereign for the legislature, <coughs> the British legislature, to have a vote on the deal that the uh, British government did. And we'll have to wait and see what that vote entails. Yes, but, but I mean, after that, would you think that that should be then be put to a referendum? Well, if, if, if the MPs, if the, if the parliament we voted for, put aside the Lords for a second, have decided to accept the deal made by the uh, government. I'm not sure that it's necessary to have a second referendum because they've accepted it. The question, which is more interesting, what happens if Parliament rejects the deal done by HMG? Mm. Which they're entitled to do because the British Parliament is sovereign. Mm. Mm. <coughs> okay. Caroline, we need to proceed with a, a bit more speed in terms of our questions. Oh, yes, that was going to very, very good discussion so far. And um, I want to look at the key sectors in London. Um, looking at the financial services sector, so um, I was, you know, people like the chief of the London Stock Exchange have been talking about London could be stripped of lucrative euro clearing facilities, could cost investors 100 billion over five years, losing 230,000 jobs. What are, you, what are the current concerns that you're picking up from the financial services sector and what are the current scale of sort of planned relocations from the city? So I'll, I'll be very careful because obviously some people, some, some of the uh, things I'm telling are in confidence yes, uh, and obviously we don't want to have a domino situation. So I'll talk about the stuff that's in the public domain, which is um, there was a report very recently uh, which uh, from, a, from a consultancy firm which said if there is a hard Brexit, uh, we would lose £10 billion in terms of tax revenues mm -hmm. and 75,000 jobs just from the financial sector. Uh, I was at CBI lunch two weeks ago and the uh, Caroline Fairburn made an excellent speech and made the point that we must have details of the transitional deal by the latest, the first quarter mm -hmm. of next year. Uh, otherwise, businesses who are members of CBI and others will make plans, contingency plans to leave. It's in, the, it's in the press now, uh, Goldman Sachs have reserved a number of floors on a residential development in Frankfurt and have reserved spaces in schools for some of their staff uh, in relation to Plan B. And here's the really scary thing, there is no reverse gear. Once a company decides to leave and have a plan and, and reserve office space in Bra Paris, Frankfurt, Brussels and pay in those location costs, they're not going to pay another location cost to come back to London. And that's why when Len asked me in relation to the next phase of discussions with David Davis, what is the priority, mm -hmm. it's got to be transition arrangements and deals. That's why actually today and tomorrow is so important in relation to European Council. If it's the case, for example, that we aren't able to bear through with the European Council, we can't, do, we can't give details of a transitional deal this side of Christmas, it's a problem for us. 
particularly in the financial sector, I'll tell you why. If you're, if you're a bank which already has a presence in a city in Europe, you've got a bit more leading time. Yeah. If you haven't got a presence in a city in Europe, you need at least uh, a year to 18 months leading time to set up an office. So the steps you're taking <coughs> to try and protect the, the, our financial centre, and um, particularly, I mean, the conversations I'd had at, at the conference season with people from the city were saying, actually, we need something by the end of this year. We, we, we can't, I can't go any longer. Are you getting any sense from government as part of, I guess it would be the next stage of trade deal, that, that there may be some scope for much greater transition to really help some of these city firms so they stay in no, Can I just say this? I mean, I, I'm not under, underplaying the role we have. I think it really boils down to the government being able to give some assurance and certainty to these businesses. By the way, they read all the stuff we say in the media, they read what's happening in, in, in the high ranks of the Conservative Party. They would have seen today some people talking about just walking away if they can't do a deal with the EU mm. this week, which, which is not what we want. Um, and so, by the way, I don't think the Prime Minister's listening to those representations. I think, okay. I think the Prime Minister and her team get the reason why it's important. Um, and that's why I think you've seen a change. If you, I mean, if you just analyse what our government has said over the last few weeks, there's been progress made. Uh, the problem is, Different people say different things, which which yeah. which, um, which these businesses see. I think we need some movement this side of Christmas. I think I think those who are saying first quarter next year are being optimistic. Um, by the way, we've not even discussed in detail aviation, you mentioned financial services. Yeah. That's another worry people have got as well. These aren't, by the way, they, these aren't business leaders. Don't scare No, they, no. they don't. It's not in their interest. You know, it could be alleged we do as politicians. Uh, uh, they don't need to because they're thinking about their business. And at the end of the day. If you're the CEO or CD person in charge of a business, you're accountable to your shareholders. You can answer the question, why you didn't plan for a contingency that, that was foreseeable, which is, which is there'd be no transitional deal or it being a bad one. And that's why they're, they're, they're getting a bit nervous. Okay, thank you. Um, and what um, reassurances are you getting from the government about um, f for London business and sectors that rely on low skilled and medium skilled <coughs> occupations? for them being able to continue to recruit from the EU, at least in the short term? So I think the phrase we should use is, is lower skilled, because otherwise we might get... Uh, so so lo it's lower skilled um, uh, EU citizens who are in London from hospitality, accommodation, mm. uh, social care, uh, uh, admin, manufacturing, construction, a whole host of, uh, of jobs being uh, done. Roughly speaking, between a third of 40% EU born outside the uh, UK. The good news is, um, I think, the government starts to make progress in relation to the, the, the guarantees to those who are already here. There's two charges, those who are already here and those who need to still come because of the dynamic workforce. Uh, unemployment rates, generally speaking, are quite low, yet there still needs to fill vacancies. There are, there are so many unfilled vacancies across London, particularly the lower skilled jobs. Uh, and there's two things that should worry us. One is, we aren't seeing uh, people from the EU coming to fill those vacancies. Um, by the way, there aren't sufficient people unemployed, uh, inverted commas, indigenous to fill those vacancies either. Mm -hmm. So people aren't coming. Two, people are starting to leave. Yeah. Um, and so that should worry us. Now, so far, the government's made no movement in relation to uh, uh, what happens post uh, leaving the EU. The good news is there's been some movement from the Prime Minister with the, with the Facebook stuff yes. overnight, which gives some reassurance, I think not enough, because this June 2016, we're now in October 2017. And you heard the evidence yourself from those, so not enough, but that's some reassurance to those who are already here, nothing for those who we need to come here and stuff. Uh, and by the way, if we are going to grow more fruit, or grow, more, grow more food, uh, anybody who understands anything about growing more food understands that actually it's, it's lower school stuff done by EU citizens mainly. And so uh, I don't, I, I, you know. Okay, so there's nothing moved on that. Um, the um, London Chamber of Commerce and the City of London have put forward this idea of the London visa. Is that concept <coughs> off the table now? Um, or what kind of immigration policy are you pushing the government for? So the London Chamber of Commerce, uh, PwC, uh, City of London Corporation have done some excellent mm. uh, work in relation to regional visas, regional work permits, you can call them whatever you want. Uh, in, in the words of PwC, they call them thought leadership papers, they were trying to provoke thought, yeah. get us moving yeah. and stuff, they did some really good work, they looked at Canada, other parts of the world. In my view, that's a plan B or C. Uh, we're not all in now, but the real prize is a national immigration system that understands what our needs are. And let me give you, let me give you one example why uh, this is so important for us. 
the government talks about immigration that's net tens of thousands. Let's say for argument's sake, it's 99,999,000, tens of thousands, right? We roughly take 38% of immigration, net immigration. So we'd get 38,000 38, uh, net immigration under the new system, 38,000. Just construction alone, we employ 300,000 in London, 300,000. Half of those UK born, up to 20% are retiring in the next five years of the UK born construction. So just construction <laughs> would struggle badly with tens of thousands going forward. And that's before you get into culture, tech, yeah. finance, social care, teaching, and all the other areas. That's why you know, I can't give you optimism in relation to the discussions I've had going forward. I do think David Davis gets it. Yeah. Now that's the first step in any, yes, you know, absolutely. you've got to make sure that the person understands what your concerns are. He understands London's concerns. And the two points I make is this, we need it, but also the referendum vote in London confirms yeah. we want it. Yeah. And that's a very important distinction between other parts of the country. And I say this in a patronizing way. They may not, I think they need it, but they, may, they don't want it. And that's a discussion for them to have. Not being fair, that's not, that's not no. the mayor of London's. Yeah, no, no. Uh, there's some overlap, that's not really my priority, priority concern. In London, we want it and need it. And, and to be fair to David Davis, again, I've given him too much credit, maybe I'll get, you know, but, but credit where it's due, he gets the points. And the, the, the points we're making, John Sorrell's making, uh, Alice, Gist is, Alice Gast is making, we've been making, I think are landing. Well, it's reassuring to hear that you are having such constructive talks because, you know, from just watching the news broadcast, you just feel so depressed about this whole subject. Um, my final question to you is about that issue you're saying about UK born workers. What support would you doing to fill that skills gap? Because, and if you've got all these people retiring, as you say, it's even, it makes it even worse. So this, you the, can I say, this, you actually touched upon actually a really important thing we have to do as politicians, which is not give the impression I'm not saying you are. I, I, and you never do, but not give the impression we mustn't redouble our efforts to scale up our own people. Yeah. I say that in, in shorthand, but you know what I mean. So my point is this, we've got to make sure we scale up Londoners for the jobs of tomorrow. But I'm saying even though we are Construction Academy, uh, Digital Pipeline, um, all the work we're doing Skills for Londoners, um, some of it funded by the EU by the way, uh, we still need a dynamic uh, EU workforce coming to London, Londoners. And I make this point, and you asked, your first question was about <coughs> lower skilled workers. Actually, lots of the jobs we're talking about are lower skilled. Uh, and we've got to recognise that even if every single unemployed Londoner, who's not an EU citizen, was to do these um, lower skilled jobs, if they wanted to, there'd still be vacancies. Mm -hmm. And that's my point about dynamic workforce. And I, I think you've got, to, you've got to separate EU people coming here from non-EU. There's a different discussion about uh, the, how clunky non-EU immigration is and the problems around students. But I think you recognise in London, we need lower skilled people to do these jobs. Mm -hmm. Our personal experiences from buying a sandwich to going to a hotel, uh, to a whole host of issues, we know that the huge role they play help our city take over, help our city become thriving and flourishing. But there's more medium skilled jobs, whether it's in things that you talk about construction, but childcare, all those sorts of things that are, are really um, propped up by EU citizens. Are you looking at putting in some specific programmes, whether it's through the LEAP or whatever, to try to target those groups? So, yes, yeah, so, so LEAP are doing uh, lots of work around this. Uh, you'll have heard yesterday some of the work that's EU funded around mm. enterprise, around lower skilled, about getting people back to work, skills, the skills agenda and stuff. The stuff we do around digital is also around this. So, we are, we are some, of this stuff, some of this stuff won't bear fruit for a while, because there's definitely a, an immediate need. Uh, some of it will bear fruit pretty soon, but I don't think that will fill the gap, no. the massive gap, <coughs> which has been left by the Brexit uh, discussions and, and Brexit ultimately. Thank you very much. We're, we're now going to, we've got about another four or five questions, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, Gareth, we're going to move into the structural drums. Yeah. Um, over to you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Yes, Mr. Mayor, we, we had a discussion yesterday uh, with Alex, among others, uh, about the uh, European Structural Investment Funds. Um, which of your programmes, this is the, I was going to say scaremongering section, but it's not really, uh, it's the scene setting section. Which of your, uh, which of your programmes would be most at risk if the government didn't replace the European Structural Funds to the same level they're at at the moment? There's a number of, I can go through some of you. Yes, so, so, yep. so, so as far as the, so there's three pots of money. There's, 
big pots of money. Euro European structural and investment funds. There's the separate transnational funds, Horizon 2020, and there's separately the um, European Investment Bank. As far as the European structural and investment funds are concerned, the big areas of spend in relation to there are around skills. Uh, so I'll give you a couple of examples. You heard one yesterday, mm -hmm. the Enfield project. Um, I won't yep. go into that again. British Fashion Council gets significant monies from the ERDF. Some of the energy efficiency work we're doing gets a number of money from the ERDF. Uh, work we're doing in relation to training people, drive forward foundation gets money from uh, the same pots of money. So that gives you a flavor, but basically think about it as employment skills, enterprise, some of the low carbon stuff. Mm. Um, and just, just, to, just to remind those who aren't experts, a lot of this is much funded by the government and by us, so we, we should it's assume. Uh, and it's money we put in, and again, we put into a pot of money, and we, yeah. we bid for some of it back, uh, and so, and then we match funding stuff, and it does lead to big differences. Mm. Um, the government have said that they will um, replace it, uh, and the method for doing that has the UK Shared Prosperity Fund, but there's very little detail yeah. in the public domain around what that will mean, how it will work. The match funding thing is interesting because people will focus on the half a billion pounds or thereabouts that we get from ESIF, but uh, that's match funded, so it's really a billion pounds. So if the quid pro quo for this is that we only get half a billion pounds and not the match funding, then you're down 500 million, which is not great. Um, in the context of your discussions with the Secretary of State, I mean David Davis, when I say that, has, is that something you've touched on? Do you know more detail about that? So, so the, the, the detail of the UK Shared Prosperity Fund is sparse in public, sparse in private as well. Um, so, so the match funding stuff is important though. Can I give you one specific example which is relevant to our discussions? So uh, adult education budgets, uh, we've got a, a memorandum of understanding with the government that will be devolved to us in 1920. From the European Social Fund we have £200 million we can use for skills, which is one of the reasons why we can't afford to delay on the devolution, because if we do we could lose the, because match funding, we could only use £200 million from here. Yep. It gets four million pounds. Mm. If we if we get this wrong, the devolution doesn't happen. It means we lose two million pounds. Not much funding. We lost four million pounds. So yeah. we've not just lost two million pounds. So you're right to make that point of much funding. Mm. The details aren't there. That's why my criticism publicly is we need details because the details are there for assurance for that the, you heard yesterday some of your uh, mm. uh, uh, witnesses just understand need to understand reassurance and just to remind people outside of London is you know unemployment rates in some parts of London are very high. Deprivation rates in parts of London are very high, so we need this money. I don't want people to think that we're, you know, the city of milk and honey, where you know there's, there's you know, everything's hunky dory. It's not. This money is needed to help Londoners, you know, fulfil their potential, get the skills, mm. be, be good taxpayers. Um, is this one of the subjects you've been pushing with the Secretary of State? It's not been a, a specific agenda item, but mm. it's been an issue raised in general, right. uh, raised in particular around the life sciences discussion. Life sciences levers in a lot of money from Europe in relation to not just Horizons 2020 and the Erasmus stuff, but actually we are the biggest, as a city, we get the most money from some of that joint research funding stuff, um, and we'd be the biggest losers. And so in the, in the first um, sector meeting we had on, on life sciences, there was a big issue there in relation to how we'd be affected going forward. The short answer, not, not a flippant sense from the government is, in the, in the, meet, in the short term, uh, Philip Hammond's guaranteed up until 2020, uh, which is some reassurance, when it comes to some of the life sciences R&D work, it's three, four, five years, as it goes over 2020, and they need to have some answers. If you're a, 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 you know, a talented scientist from any part of the world, and you've come to London, you want to know you've got funding for five years, or for three years, or for seven years. You're making you know, life choices based on this funding going forward and stuff. That uncertainty is causing huge problems, in particular in life sciences, but, but you, you've given other, other examples from yesterday in relation to enter, en, enter enterprise. Those are shorter term issues, but mm. for life science is a bigger issue, no detail yet. <coughs> okay, is this something you will be pushing in future meetings? With this absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, John. Okay, um, can I just ask, so there was a Congress of Leaders meeting last, last week, I believe. There were two items on the agenda, unconnected, but connected. One was the, the development of business rates, and the other one was around, I think, the beginnings of a discussion of what some a strategy between yourself and London councils. Would it be possible for us to have access to that, that, to that papers, if we yes. could? And thank you for that. And then if we can turn, one of the future issues 
is around, um, and it came up in discussions yesterday, it's not so much in terms of capacity for the LEAP, but the changing nature of the, the challenges the LEAP faces on a post-Brexit agenda. Are we in a position, or will we be in a position to start looking at, not, I, you know, I know that it will open up a, you know, a geographical issue. Should we have one LEAP or a number of LEAPs in London? And I still think you can have devolvement, even if there's one strategic LEAP in terms of the work and the work that carried on the ground. Is there any um, initial discussions around looking at the role of the LEAP post-Brexit? So we had a, there was, there was a review that was undertaken uh, in relation to the LEAP before it became the leap, yep. before it became the leap. It leapt from a lap to a leap. Mm. Um, so that review has been undertaken. Um, not specifically thinking about Brexit, the consequences of uh, Brexit. Um, actually, a lot, of, a lot of thought being given about devolution. So I'll give you, let me give you one example. One of the areas, uh, depending on which time of day I've asked the question, uh, and depending on how glassful I am, <laughs> I'm really excited about skills. Because the devolution of adult education, yeah. businesses, not a, just finally getting it why it's important to train up London. Because bigger, what's the biggest gripe employees have? People haven't got the skills we need. They can't, you know. Employees are up for it. Devolution of AEB, apprenticeship levy, Brexit. It makes it very exciting potentially if we get it right in relation to skills in London and stuff. Uh, um, and so, so the, the leaps are already adept at doing that. We've got business, business representatives, <coughs> small, medium, uh, large employers. We've got people from the uh, uh, from councils. We've got people from different parts of London, and so Leap is, I think, in a good place to capture that. Uh, I'm not. I don't think we've got a specific thought, you know, in relation to what are the consequences of Brexit going forward. But we, we realise it's around the corner. Um, with a caveat, we're not sure how long the transitional period will be. Let's say, for argument's sake, for argument's sake, it's three years. Let's say it's two years, let's say four years. That, that, that means, actually, I'm not being complacent, by the way, mm. we're now talking about 2021, 22, 23, which gives us some more time to understand the detail because you've got to plan. It's difficult to plan for something without knowing what's, what's coming. So the hard Brexit is a scenario very different from, you know, access to a membership of single market to a deal with the EU. And so that's why it's a bit difficult, but we recognise the skills agenda is so crucial for us, for us here. Caroline and I were just talking about you know, EU lower skilled uh, migration, but actually we've got to, look, our future must be as a high skilled, high paid economy. There's no, we can't compete with, with some parts of the world registered low skilled, you know, low paid job. That's before we get to automation and AI. We are doing work on automation and AI, by the way, uh, uh, leaving stuff, because we've got, that's around the corner. Okay. Um, I'm not planning to ask any further questions around um, crime and security, because I think we covered that, and I think you quite eloquently told us what your position is on that. And we might comment further in a letter, a stranger letters with you. So let's move on to the last one, just about EU nationals. The last two questions from Caroline Russell. Um, yes, um, we. This relates um, to a, an open mic session we held in the summer, where we heard really devastating testimony from people who's um, a. a finding you know, they came here with trust, they made their lives here, and they are suddenly facing a, a degree of uncertainty that is really very, very difficult for them. We heard um, a sort of <coughs> about a, a mistrust now with um, EU citizens engaging with um, institutions like the NHS or education because they're worried about how their data is going to be used and whether it's actually going to be used against them and whether it might mean that they're unable to stay. We heard about women falling through the gaps um, uh, if they've been involved in part-time work because of caring responsibilities either for older people or for their children and finding that they're not qualifying for whatever the hoops are that they're expected to jump through. And we heard from organisations who are trying to provide support but actually there is such a lack, lack of clarity about what the law will be and what hoops people have to jump through in order to be able to stay here that, you know, that it's actually very, very difficult for them to give advice, so we um, we wrote to you, and we um, sort of grateful for your response. Um, but I just wonder if you could. Um, we called on you to show further leadership in um, tackling, you know, these issues that EU nationals are facing living in our city. And do you agree that this leadership, further leadership, is needed? And if so, what exactly will that involve? 
So firstly, look, can I say, I read the transcripts of the session you had, and it, it's often very difficult to get emotion from a transcript, but the emotion was there from the mm. transcripts. Yeah. And I particularly was um, uh, upset by some of the open, open mic sessions, which are deeply upsetting. Mm. These are people, these are our neighbours, yeah. they're our friends, yeah. members of my family. And so this, this is very, uh, and you, you could sense this though, if we're honest, from June the 24th last year. People who'd been there for years and years and years felt this was an attack on them. Uh, they took it personally. Um, that's aside from the rise in hate crime. And I've tried since June the 24th to provide that leadership. Uh, London is open. Uh, thanking Londoners of, who are East citizens for their contribution. Um, saying they'll always be welcome here. And um, of course we can always do more. And I've tried to do more. But uh, say this, Caroline, I've looked at what other leaders around the country and what others have done. And if there are ideas I can pinch, I'm happy to pinch. But I say this with humility, I don't think anybody's done more than I have to try and reassure these EU citizens that this is their home. We value them. They help us be the greatest city in the world. We don't want it to change. What they need though, and what they're asking me for, is to put pressure on the Prime Minister to give them the assurance that I can't give. To ask the government to give them the certainty I can't give. And that's why I welcome, I don't think it's gone far enough, what the Prime Minister did overnight in relation to Facebook, the, the post you made. But the reality is, you know, people are making life choices. I have spoken to uh, managers of construction sites who tell me some of their teams have left, gone back to country of origin, because they'd rather be in inverted commas, the first one back before the rush begins. I've been, I've, I've been told that they can't fill vacancies because people aren't uh, arriving. I've, I've, been, I've heard some of the stories you heard about, about mortgages not being able to be gotten, or people making life choices about applying for passports for other EU countries. This is happening now. And we're now in October 2017, so I'm happy and I, and, I, and I hope my response was taken in the spirit of I'm very happy to receive your ideas and I'll do whatever I can and carry and do what I, what I can to make, to make these Londoners feel welcome. Well, I think all the stuff that you're doing to, to lobby the gov government for, you know, to provide people with certainty is obviously incredibly valuable, but I think people need concrete help here in London right now. They need access to advice, they need, um, you know, they need, they need more support and um, uh, you know, the this citizenship and integration initiative, which was set up in April. Um, I mean, I just wonder whether there's there's more that you could be uh, doing for love for these Londoners, um, just in terms of actually, you know, helping to make sure that people do have access to the advice of the most up-to-date situation in terms of what they need. Is there anything else you can do on that? Yeah, well, there, there, there are more things we're doing. So we're working with London councils in relation to the Strategic Mig Migration Partnership. We're speaking to, um, you've, you talked about the new initiative we've set up, the Citizens and Integration Initiative, working closely with London citizens in relation to uh, that. Some of the pieces of work we're doing in relation to uh, policing to make sure that there is, um, every borough now has um, a, a hate crime liaison officer, really important uh, to do, separately set up the online uh, hate crime database. But we're happy to receive ideas in relation to what things we can do uh, and we'll carry on doing more. But actually all, all these things are a plaster on what is a big issue, which is the lack of certainty people have about their future. That's why it's crucial. That's why I welcome what the EU, what the EU did. The EU said, look, one of the first things that's going to be resolved as a matter of urgency is the rights of EU citizens. By the way, that includes British citizens in the yes, EU, uh, but also EU citizens who are here. And I, and I welcome that, and that's why I welcome the move by the Prime Minister October 2017 to give some reassurance. It's not the cast iron guarantee I've been calling for. And sort of specifically around um, hate crime, can you give us any sort of update on kind of um, resource advice centres that that could be provided here in London? The key thing is to give people the confidence to report um, when they've been the victim of hate crime. Not to think that anything is too trivial to report. Let the police determine whether it's a crime or not. By the way, crime is a crime whether it's done online or whether it's done face-to-face. -face. Mm -hmm. That's why the online crime pub is uh, very uh, important. We're going to build confidence in these communities. A lot of these communities, our communities, have the confidence to report things to the police or people in positions of power. So can we, can we encourage third-party reporting? And we're trying to do that as well. How the British Transport Police and TfL respond is very important, the NHS responding. So it's trying to educate those who are meeting people in, meet, meeting citizens, how to deal with people who report hate crime. Good news, 
the, this, the spike we saw after referendum and, and there are other hate crimes we see after terrorist attacks, uh, those spikes have come down. Mm -hmm. uh, we are be be better at addressing people's uh, concerns. Uh, people do have a sense of belonging in London. People still love living here. Uh, we should, we could have, we've got to make sure we're not complacent. Thank you. Um, Gareth Bacon. Just yeah, thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, you talked about the Prime Minister's Facebook page, which I've, I've read and put in front of me. Um, but it doesn't go, you welcome it, but it doesn't go far enough. Um, what's missing? What, what would you have liked her to say in addition to what she did say? Well, first, I think it's October 2017, so people have had this uncertainty caused by the, uh, by, by the delay. Point, but what's missing from the, the statement that you would want on top of what she said? Cast iron guarantee, you've got the same rights in the future as you've got now. Yeah. Um, what happens to those who've come since uh, June 2016? Because what she said is, um, I couldn't be clearer, EU citizens living lawfully in the UK so they will be able to stay. Uh, this agreement will not only provide certainty about residence, but also healthcare pensions and other benefits. Yes, yeah, so what happens to those who came post uh, uh, June 2016? Mm -hmm. What happens to those who. Uh, she, she, what one thing she promised well, says, It says <coughs> EU citizens living lawfully in the UK today, <coughs> October 2017, will be able to stay. So that somebody applies come, to those that have come since the referendum. Somebody who comes tomorrow. Say if somebody here falls, has, has, is in love with somebody, they've arrived last week, but their partner they're in love with comes next week. Okay. So it's, it's that aspect that's missing. Oh, I, I mean, I, I can send you a list of the concerns I've got with her statement. The point being is, 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 is I welcome it. It doesn't go far enough. What there should be is a cast iron guarantee um, that everyone who, uh, well, it depends what date you use. My view, you use the date end of, end, end of transition. Everyone who's here um, before the end of transition has the same rights uh, they had before June 2016. It's really important they give they give them that cast iron guarantee on a whole host of issues. You mentioned health in relation to the particular issues. What about family reunion? What about people who are here but their partner or family or, or, or others are in other parts of the European uh, Union? So the whole whole host of issues that aren't addressed by that. If the, if the Prime Minister was to say uh, today, I give a cast iron guarantee to every EU citizen in our country who's here before the interpretation period will have the same rights they had before June 2016. I think people will be reassured. Mm. Okay. okay, any <coughs> further questions? Well, can I thank you, uh, Mayor, in the way that you've answered our questions in that. Is there anything else you want to say to us that you think that we've not quite covered or done justice in terms of uh, your positions that you've taken today? The final point, Mayor, is first thank, thank you for having me here and uh, for the way we've uh, had the, spent the last hour. No one's ever done this before. Leaving the European Union, uh, reaching a deal with the European Union, uh, us having a change of relationship with the European Union. I think we're all learning along the process and stuff. So if there are things I could be doing better, I'm really happy to take advice from the Assembly. If there are things that you think we've not thought of, don't hesitate to let me know whether it's Caroline's advice in relation to how we make EU citizens feel more welcome. Similarly, I think we've got to put pressure on the government. I think the point that Gareth had raised in relation to devolution going forward, this is an opportunity for us. And so I think you know we, we are literally writing the rule book. And so I'm really happy to, you know, be tutored and stuff. And I think we've got to, we've got to have that spirit of working together because we will kick ourselves if deal is done and it's not good for London, which is not good for our country. Well, thank you very much for that. And I can, can I say, I hesitate in terms of being amongst different political opinions around the table, but I think we are very reassured by the dialogue that you're having with David Davis in the way that you've explained that to us and on the issues that you're picking up. And of course, there are issues that we will uh, write to you about if we feel that actually we just want to make sure whether you're doing it either to reinforce what you're doing or to suggest uh, some other alternatives but thank you very much for your time here today we will, we will schedule another time at the appropriate if you feel there's something you want to come back to address us on then you can say it's two ways uh, one suggestion yeah. though, which is you know, even if he himself isn't going to come back, whether you invite David Davis or somebody else from government, yeah. just and, uh, you know, just to exp yeah. ask the questions you've asked to me, because I'd be interested to hear what, what their view is in relation to, you know, the discussion, the negotiations, and, and what London can get out of it. Oh, thank you. Very helpful. Well, thank you very much. Now, committee members, we're asked to note the report of the discussion. We agree. The date of the next meeting is yet to be scheduled, so you will be advised. Uh, there being no any other business, I now close this meeting. That was good. Thank you. I think we do as well. I think we need to work. And also, I suppose, be represented on this devolution.